Disclaimer, this video is largely going to be negative. All opinions are my own and I make no pretenses of being unbiased, but I'm also not being paid by anybody to make this, and I still hope to be informative while going into my opinions. I also want to say that I'm going to get a bit cross with Colossal Biosciences, but in no way do I think any individuals working for that company deserve any harassment online or in real life. Lastly, this will contain sensitive but still direct discussion of animal deaths and extinction, so use your best judgment if you want to watch this right now or not. Alright, so what somehow made me make a relevant video again? Why am I not talking about a 20-year-old sci-fi TV show or secondary manga characters? Well, there's a very good chance if you live in the publishing ranges of several of the United States most read journals, magazines, and newspapers that you've heard that Colossal Biosciences Incorporated, a private biotech company out of Dallas, Texas, has purportedly brought dire wolves out of extinction. They claim, and publications as famous as Time, The New Yorker, Newsweek, USA Today, and NPR have co-signed that they have successfully reversed extinction for the first time. In actuality, nearly every independent conservationist that I've spoken to, as well as ones that I've seen comment on this online, agree that the direwolf, Canis deerus, is not a no longer extinct animal, as much as Colossal likes to claim that they have resurrected the species. So what exactly did Colossal do? In full transparency, I am a zoologist and an educator, but most of my work is focused on conservation, so I will not claim myself as an expert by any means in genetics or biotechnology. So I will be largely relying on the works of others. I will cite and link them below. From Colossal themselves, they recovered direwolf DNA and sequenced about 0.1% of the species genome. There are numbers there. Using this sequencing as a roadmap, they made 20 individual edits across 14 genes in the gray wolf genome to make a handful of differences. Using wolves with minimal domestic dog DNA, they purport to be closer to what dire wolves were. They take this modified genome and form a nucleus, which they then insert into a wolf ovum that has already had its nucleus removed. You might recognize this as somatic cell nuclear transfer. That's the same thing that was used to clone Dolly the sheep all those years ago, or more recently, Zhong Zhong and Hua Hua, the crab-eating macaques. The difference is, well, those three were clones in the literary sense, actual copies of parent organisms. These ova were unique, novel organisms with modified versions of gray wolf DNA. Once stimulated, the embryos were implanted in domesticated dogs who served as surrogate mothers. The first so-called litter produced two males, named Romulus and Remus, and the second so-called litter produced one female, named Khaleesi. These births occurred several months ago, but the public announcement was made uh, about two weeks ago or so, with, as mentioned, international attention. Now, when you lay it all out in quick succession, without theatrics and quotes from fantasy authors and television actors, I think most people would agree that these are not actually dire wolves. They are more like dire wolves than any other gray wolves alive today, but when we have less than 1% of their genome sequenced, we can't even begin to pretend we actually know what a true dire wolf's genetic code looks like. Likewise, dire wolves are likely like other canids, meaning Colossal's claims that they act like dire wolves without being raised by dire wolf parents is pure speculation. So if these aren't actually dire wolves, saying that they are no longer extinct would be pretty ridiculous. But honestly, even if they were from a conservation standpoint, you'd be hard pressed to consider them no longer extinct. Three individuals are not the same as an extant population, and being raised by people on a preserve is not the same as being raised in the wild by parents of the same species. Part of my job includes the rearing and releasing of endangered species, specifically lake sturgeon and monarch butterflies. With modern, minimally invasive tracking technology, we can see how effective these Head Start programs are. Some species do very well with this kind of reintroduction. Reptiles, fish, and insects, which typically do not need as much parental care as mammals, or sometimes they don't need any, are some of the best at it. Mammals and birds in general are much harder to reintroduce to the wild, as many of them must be taught how to live as a wild specimen of their species by their parents. There are some ways around this, as seen with the milu in China or the black-footed ferret here in the States, but it's definitely an additional difficulty. 
But I must stress that something being difficult doesn't mean something is not worth attempting. What does make the reintroduction of direwolves not necessarily worth attempting is the fact that an actual reintroduction of actual direwolves would likely be disastrous all around. The majority of a direwolf's known diet is either extinct or endangered in modern North America. Either they would contribute to increased pressure on threatened species, or they would adapt to hunting suboptimal prey, which may drive them to endangerment as well. Gray wolf reintroductions are plagued by frightened ranchers hunting wolves that get too close to them in their flocks, and that would almost certainly be the case with this species, especially with how much Colossal is overhyping their weight. Dire wolves were also adapted for a very different world than what exists today. Aside from the loss of multiple habitats during the Quaternary Extinction event, like the Mammoth Steppe, many of the species with which the dire wolf coexisted are extinct. They may not have hunted Smilodons, Mastodons, Teratorns, or Ground Sloths, but they were limited by them, controlled by them, and will not be controlled in the same way by the megafauna that survived to the present. No competitors and no unobtainable prey means the dire wolf would not fulfill the same role it did 10,000 years ago. And since its extinction, nature has balanced its populations. Definitely populations have been unbalanced largely in the last 500 years, but introducing a species from thousands of years ago in the past to attempt to make things like they were half a thousand years ago is laughably naive. This is all without getting into the animal welfare side of things. Now, I maintain that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. I am not opposed to captive breeding programs for endangered species that can feasibly be saved and reintroduced, nor am I opposed to genetic manipulation of animals for medical research when necessary. I understand and am sympathetic to those who believe humans have no place at all in artificially modifying genetic structures, but simply on a personal level, I can overlook my discomfort if a modification is absolutely necessary and can save lives. However, as stated, this program is not necessary, something that I'm sure the very bright scientists at Colossal understand. Realistically, the driver behind this program, the reason Colossal is going after reviving dire wolves, woolly mammoths, and dodos instead of the bramble key melamus or the slender billed curlew, is twofold attention and money. This is obvious by their obsession with pop culture references. Their website, with the same fervor by which it talks about the roles Dire Wolf supposedly could play in today's ecosystem, brags about getting donations from Seth Green and George R.R. R. Martin. I say this more for a friend of the channel, Okairo, than myself, but don't you have a job you should be doing, George? This company is bankrolled by billionaires, and not in the way many other science companies are. Rather than take a couple thousand from several billionaires, this company is run by CEO Ben Lam, serial entrepreneur and multi-billionaire obsessed with media attention. Lam himself has admitted that he's not interested in conducting these projects on things like tiny lizards, which makes it pretty clear that this is mostly about the spectacle, which he's gotten. And just like how I don't think spectacle is a good reason to keep orcas in captivity or to teach bears to do tricks, I don't think spectacle is a good reason to put these surrogate dog mothers through this process. Colossal has been intentionally shady about their processes, releasing information more like a Nintendo Direct than a scientific journal. I reached out to them on this point and, after a week, have not heard back from them. However, I feel confident saying that there is a very good chance that these three pups, who, by the way, I want to say did nothing wrong and admittedly are very adorable, were not the first attempted clones. Consider the Pyrenean ibex, the last such species, or in their case, subspecies, to have a widely publicized de-extinction cloning attempt, though not nearly as widely publicized. José Foch et al., working under Servicio de Investigación Agroalimentaria del Gobierno de Aragón and Institut Nacional de la Recherche Agronomique, pardon my uh, French and Spanish pronunciations there, created genetic clones of the animal using very similar technology as to what Colossal is using, and all but one of the fetuses were miscarried. The one that did survive until birth had atelectasis and an extra lobe in her left lung, dying minutes later. Now imagine that instead of scientists who publish the full extent of their research under the supervision of the Spanish and French government, these were venture capitalists withholding much of their results from the scientific community, obsessed not with conservation but with entertainment, and who had to report to no authority greater than their investors. 
As I said, I could not get confirmation that the surrogate domesticated dogs suffered miscarriages, or that any pups died after birth, or that any mothers died in giving birth, but I believe there is a distinct possibility of that being the case, if for no other reason than this. Why is Khaleesi an only pup? Canids seldom have a single pup in a litter, and Romulus and Remus were twins. Why did they scale back on their production? It seems to me very possible that they didn't, but nature did. And no, the fact that the American Humane Society gave them the all-clear means nothing to me when those jokers can be paid to ignore any kind of animal abuse as we see with the set of Hobbit and Unexpected Journey. And I want to be careful here not to anthropomorphize dogs. I'm not assigning human characteristics to non-human animals when I say that mother dogs suffer when they experience stillbirths and deaths of their pups. They feel pain, physically. Whether you want to call it emotion or a cerebral reaction, the loss affects them. So if these pups are not dire wolves, if they are not going to save the environment, and they will not be feasibly released into the wild someday or provide medical knowledge to help save wild individuals, I struggle to see the justification for this project. But, perhaps beyond all else, what irritates me the most about this is the fact that now, science deniers have a shining example to point to as a refutation of the importance of conservation. Noted racist oil drilling enthusiast and United States Secretary of the Interior Doug Burgum has said that, because as he believes it, you can now just immediately revive any extinct animal you want, there is no reason for an endangered species list anymore. Now, I don't know Burgum personally, so I don't know if this is intentional misinterpreting that will allow him to get more access to federal or tribal land for fracking, or if he just genuinely is not smart enough to understand how conservation works. But regardless of what it is, he and every other politician, tycoon, and colonizer now have their magic word that they can say to assuage their more gullible constituents or customers' concerns. Colossal. Now, I'm not saying Colossal wants to get rid of the endangered species list or encourage dangerous, reckless practices that will inevitably harm all life on Earth and disproportionately affect marginalized communities, but when they are so brazen with their misinformation, they became the perfect useful idiots for those that do. Now, our work as actual conservationists focusing on protecting actual endangered species has become even harder because Colossal has given those that simply do not care an after-the-fact justification they can rely on, and I fear likely will for decades to come. Now, I don't want to be too negative here, too late, I know, but I should say that I am not opposed to everything Colossal is doing. Their work on red wolves and actual endangered species, though still controversial, shows much more promise and conservational potential, and in a vacuum much of their genetic breakthroughs I am sure could be used in beneficial ways. But please genuinely consider before sending them your money because you want to see an Asian elephant forced to give birth to a slightly hairier Asian elephant just because tech bros and Jurassic Park enthusiasts thought it would be cool to see a woolly mammoth. There are so many great conservation projects out there in need of funding, and they are much more deserving of your support. Our planet is interconnected, and we need to support each other, since we can't trust the powerful to support us. And supporting each other includes supporting the life, land, air, and waters we all need to survive.